the only way to do precise modeling of the mind while it be, you know, being true to the cognitive character of the problem. So I'm not converting it into a neuroscience problem, I'm not converting it into a maths problem. I'm keeping it as a cognitive problem and yet giving precise accounts of the nature of the mind. Yeah. Uh, so this is just a comment, I was just thinking about uh, when talking about statements like time flows, like uh, 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 calling somebody his dog, mm -hmm. uh, well, when we look at the concepts of say a dog or time or river, uh, there are some there are some properties of uh, the concepts that we attribute to a person. Say, uh -huh. share some pro so share some of them. Uh -huh. uh, so, I <laughs> we will come back to it if you remember. <laughs> so the, the creation of examples uh, when it would be perhaps appropriate to say that the concepts not the concepts, but the examples of the concepts are graded. Uh, I mean, there exists a gradient. For example, people, uh, some, some people might act, might say, might, might think of an, uh, a human being when they come across this word dog. Uh -huh. so, it's so, possible. Can, yeah, it's possible. So, which brings us back to the question that was raised both in one of the projects and in the conversations before, which is, how do you know that two people possess the same concept? See, if every time you think of human and you think of dogs, and I think of humans, we have a problem, yeah. right? An extreme version of it is the uh, color inversion thought experiment that I mentioned there. Whenever I see red, uh, I, whenever you see what I think of as red, you see blue, how do you know? I mean, in fact, we are actually experiencing the world differently. How can we even? have a science of the mind when the experience is so radically you know, but actually different. My question is whether calling some something some some say some experience is red or blue uh, would not uh, I mean the experience would still be the same whether you call it red or blue. No 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 so the thought experiment is that there is a red rose but there's a rose. I experience I call it red rose. And so you and I both look at it and say oh what a beautiful red rose except that the subjective feeling I have is that of red. While the subjective feeling that you have is the feeling that I have when I see something blue. You are always seeing blue when I see red, when, wherever I see red. How is it that we are able to share something? And so one possibility of course is uh, we share it because of some objective correlate in the world. Right? That what you and I are both pointing out is some wavelength, something which is the same even though my perception is different. This is Galileo's idea. Right? That we can't really be sure of what you and I share in our experience, but we can be sure of certain objective measurements. But there too the same problem arises, because if that is a concept, so if you take the concept matter, and I think of matter as you know planets hitting each other, and you think of matter as atoms hitting each other, how do we and so this is a major issue. The cognitive makers would say you don't need, there is a continuity of sharing. So some people, because maybe we grew up in the same family or the same culture, share a huge percentage of their cognitive intuitions. Other people share less. And at some point, if you don't share enough, it breaks down. That's okay. See, if the world is experiences. Uh, Spatial relationships, uh -huh. then it explains two things that you talked about before. That it is relatively difficult, if not impossible, to invent new prepositions. You can invent new objects. And that's because the mind is grown to expect new objects. There's no problem. You know, I, I have I have ways of accommodating a new object, but I do not have ways of accommodating completely new relationships. Now, the reason why that, that happens is that, going back to the day before yesterday's class, is that, you know, it's a severely constrained world. Mm -hmm. The physics of the world is very severely constrained. Therefore, there is no reason why mind which sees and experiences 
will, will experience in the system those constraints. And that also gives us the basis for us to why you and I are able to share, uh, share a lot of things because we share these constraints innately and inherently. Sure. Sure. Now, of course, the one. There's a meta level question, which is that the physics of the world makes certain kinds of spatial relations impossible. Impossible and others sort of universal. Right, so things, one thing being inside another is universal. One thing, sort of solid things just interpenetrating through each other is impossible. So, therefore, you could argue that space, by its very nature, delivers a very highly and tightly constrained vocabulary of things. Of course, objects can be of any shape and size whatsoever, that is unconstrained, and so it would be silly to create your conceptual grammar out of the shapes of things, because there are too many. But the relative spatial relations, because they are so rigidly fixed, it's a good place to start. There is, of course, the larger question, why is it that the world is that way? Okay? Why is it that the world is so neatly describable with so few elements? I mean, that's a question that neither cognitive scientists nor physicists can but the point is, it so happens that we live in a world where certain things seem to be abstractable and convertible into neat packages, which we can all carry around with us. So those are the things to make into your innate categories. And there are other things that are almost infinitely variable, and so it's better to uh, learn them in context rather than uh, carry them around. Because the plants that grow in this part of the world are very different from the plants that grow in some other part of the world. So there is no point in having some uh, you know, innate plant classification device. Right? You could have a general account that stuff is hierarchically arranged, and that's it. But plants in South India don't look like plants in uh, Latin America. Why bother having one rigid system? And so what varies and what, so the, the model would be that it's not innate versus learned, that's the real issue. It's looking at the world itself and asking which features of the world are universal and see if those are the ones that we carry in our heads and look at those features of the world that vary a lot and see to what extent that maps into the things that we learn either culturally or otherwise in context. But one, uh, one idea of this could be that, you know, if the moment I have, we have invented or discovered all the constraints that there can be, come to the end of it, right? It is just that we have not discovered all the constraints that can be. But, you know, language is kind of anticipated. This is long ago. It's a way, you know, for the ordinary common sense description of the word, we have already invented all the constraints that that can. Yes. The only question, I mean, you could argue that the opposite, which is because language has constrained the world to be such a neatly packaged thing, physics can't do anything else. Like yeah, we yes. can't have, because we are cognitively constrained, to use only our basic linguistic core concepts to make our physics as well. That is a quick way of application of concepts. <laughs> Sorry, you had a question. Uh, my question is regarding the school utilization of concept and perception. Uh -huh. So when I really uh, define a concept as uh, definition of concept and perception, I really define the concept as perception. That means I am seeing one definition from another definition. Yes. Take an example of say, uh, one say, uh, statement, uh -huh. where I have uh, a sentence, uh -huh. where I am using two prepositions on and in or over or all that. Sure. That means it transition from one another. Uh -huh. That always Maybe it always changes the meaning. Mm -hmm. So, will it affect the one representation and another representation always? Or maybe, or will it always be a optimization? Or so, this is a deep question. Actually, Bola is working on similar kinds of issues related to it, which is which representation do you use for which problem? Like how do you decide? So, suppose that I want to, I, I'm talking to you, we are having a conversation. I could choose to point to something. I could choose to flash my eyes towards it. I could choose to say it. 
I could choose to gesture its shape approximately. Which one I choose to use in the context is a very deep, difficult, I think, thing. But you can imagine that a broad optimality perspective would say you use that representational uh, capacity which has the most concise way of, or easy, whatever that might be, of representing the particular entity you want to do. So for example, if, I want, if there's a pile of cups and I want you to bring me a particular cup there, the easiest thing would be to just point to that. The next thing would be if it has some obvious feature that differentiates it. So it's yellow while the others are black, and I can just bring the yellow cup, right? But except for those kinds of very, very easy situations, it's not clear what is the, um, Partic what should I actually say? And this is what Chomsky originally called the creative aspect of language use. Now, you may have this grammar with all these combinatorial capacities in it, but at a given moment, I have to decide which sentence I'm going to actually utter. Right? I'm going to have to decide, should I say, I'm giving a talk on embodied cognition at the near summer school, or something which means almost exactly the same thing, but very different sentence. I could say, uh, Nias's third summer school is about the foundations of cognition, where embodied cognition is a major topic, and I'm going to talk about embodied cognition today. So the sentence is radically different. Its meaning is approximately the same. So which one of these two do I use? Um, seems still a very, very hard problem. It's independent, right? Independent of the independent is that meaning is same Ah, but you only utter one sentence at a given time. Now one possible, one answer is that there are an infinite number of sentences, or some large finite number of sentences, all of which have the same meaning, and I just randomly draw from it. But the embodied perspective would say that no, even so even in the choice of the sentence, there are strong constraints. So strangely enough, therefore, the, Ch the Chomsky perspective, which very rigidly constrains how the grammar is formed, but it's saying that there are these tight formal principles of universal grammar, tell you almost nothing about what is called uh, performance. Right? What I actually say is entirely unconstrained. The uh, fundamental rules that uh, dictate how I form cons uh, sentences is 100% constrained. The embodied cognition person has more flexibility in the rules and more rigidity in the actual utterance. But we don't know what those rigidities are. I mean, that's that's still sort of somewhat opaque to us. Yeah. Uh, when you said that, suppose if to convert uh, everything into spatial relations. Uh -huh. What did you exactly mean? Like time converted into space? Like, uh, we use that right in language, for example. I can say uh, summer vacation is a long way away. That's a spatialization of time. Right? It's, it's telling us, I'm talking about an event that's happening in the future, but using a path metaphor rather than a I mean, I'm not saying it's going to happen in six months. I'm saying it's a long way away. But I can say I'm pre-poning my talk by two days. Right? So pre-poning, of course, you could always not necessarily special, but you can say let's move the talk up by two days. So these are it's in every at least as far as I know the literature, it's always one way. Let's say that languages use space to talk about time. They rarely use time to talk about space. The only intermediary is they sometimes use motion to talk about space. Right? So I can say it, uh, room was buzzing with motion or, you know, or buzzing with activity. Right? Something like that. So you're filling up that space not with spatial elements but with motion elements. But time by itself is not used. And in fact, some physicists have argued that time by itself doesn't exist. It's only through change in motion that you know time. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
you say p upon dt or x square, whatever, f of x, you are actually describing, you're not using time in its intrinsic temporal sense, but as a change, in motion. So is it possible to convert everything into uh, spatial relations? Um, there are two takes on this, right? One is, yes, everything can be converted into space. The second is, since that's the way our minds are made, it's only those things that can be converted into space that we can think about. That I can't think about something that can't be converted into space. And by the way, I don't think that's pretty true. There, there are causality, there are other basic categories. But the claim is it's pretty small. So it's not like you can't, the claim would be you can't think about something which is utterly outside the realm. Yeah. You have to convert it either into space or into causality or into one of a very small number of basic categories. Whether it's only space, which would be one thing, or two or three or four categories. So, uh, I mean, say relationships or feelings, or if you convert them into space? We don't convert them into space, but we certainly, yeah, so you can, you can always talk about, so you could say, oh, she's very close to me. <coughs> I'm feeling distant to my parents. I was thinking about a similar thing while you were talking about the uh, transfer, transformation of Gaston principles to you know, uh, tool language. So the very nature of language itself is visual. I mean, you visualize what you talk, what you listen. I'm not sure. I mean, at least I, that might be very from person to person. Yeah, yeah. But then, uh, so talking about music, uh -huh. Uh, can you say that something, something is being played in the background, if something is coming it up? So that also gives me, I mean, I, this might be a subjective uh, experience. I can kind of see something happening in the background and then... See, what's interesting about music is, and so a more specific hypothesis would be the semantic elements, so the elements that have meaning have to have some spatial component. Right? So music, for example, to the extent that it seems meaningful as opposed to just a collection of notes, may also have to be understood spatially. I don't know. I mean, or rather, I don't know the research. I'm sure there are people who have looked at it. But it may be that we, there are various things that we perceive in a non-meaning oriented way. So stuff that you just grab and all that kind of motor timing and stuff like that may not really involve space and it may in fact involve proprioception or, or touch more than visual space. I mean, we may have to, you know, like have, we must have seen those maps of the body in the brain, right? So, like the thumb is represented in so much while the entire, like if you look at the body, it's shrunk and expanded in strange ways. So it may turn out that if you take the universe of objects and you represent it in terms of these categories, you will get a similar kind of misshaped view of the world. Okay, so let's end. We'll be back at 2.30. No,